and welcome to my presentation on InnoSource, which is about open source collaboration taken beyond just open source projects. For the past 15 years, I've spent my time in the Apache Software Foundation ecosystem. What I've seen there is how open source projects manage to build bridges that are crossing time zones, geographies, but also organizations. For the past two years, I've had a chance to bring that collaboration knowledge into a company called Europace here in Berlin, working to enable teams to work across boundaries and across silos. What I'm going to tell you today is our story of the past two years, the lessons that we've learned, and the principles that we've discovered. So I happen to be open source strategist at Europace AG, but I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation. A couple of years ago, actually 10 years ago, I wanted to have a few friends travel to Berlin for my birthday. I wanted to have their employers pay for the trip. How do you do that? You create a conference on all things search, scalability, NoSQL, and analytics, which was Berlin buzzwords. I did that together with Jan Lehnert, who is here today, and Simon Wilnauer. Next edition will be mid-June here in Berlin. I also created a conference called Fast Backstage, which essentially brings together people from the Linux Foundation, Apache Software Foundation, um, Eclipse Foundation, as well as individuals to discuss all things open source economics, open source legal, and open source governance. This talk was done in collaboration with Tobias Gesellschen sitting right here. <laughs> He's a software developer at Europace, maintainer of open source projects, and generally active in the free and open source ecosystem. So I've been mentioning our company name a couple times. We are active in the financial space, connecting banks with distributors, essentially building a platform where you can go to a shop and tell them that you want a mortgage, and they will use our platform in order to compute the best offer for you. Now, this sounds like a fintech, except that we are 20 years old and well-established and profitable. It sounds extremely boring and hierarchical, except that we are very agile, um, and the goal in our management structure is to move decision-making towards where the knowledge actually is. And this is where InnoSource really comes into play. Europace itself is a 170-people company, belongs to a larger holding called Hyperport, which has like 1,500 employees. So now that you know where I'm coming from, what I would like to learn is what's your company size? How many people here in the room are working for a company with like 10 people, startup-ish? Okay, maybe like 10%. What about 100? Two, three, what about corporations with 1,000 to 10,000 people? Okay, like 10%. How many of you have had the feeling in the past that instead of going in circles, getting priority to have your fix rolled out to the team that you depend on would have been um, faster achieved by doing the work yourself? Maybe one quarter? Um, how many of you work in engineering? 70% maybe? What about UX? One, two, three, not that many. How many product owners do we have in the room? None? One? Um, any operations people? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. How many of you know the feeling of, wait a minute, this looks broken in our deployment, but Jim's no longer here. We have no clue how to fix it. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> Lots of smiling faces, people not daring to raise your hand. <laughs> Okay, how many teams do we have which are fully remote? 10%, okay. How many do we have 
which have more than one office? One quarter? How many have at least remote individuals in your team or in your company? Half of it, okay. So the reason why you want to look into your inner source is if you come from an HL background, you probably have heard about um, putting more emphasis on non-formal negotiations. If you have an HL team that's taken this to the extreme, you may have ended up with a team that doesn't do any documentation as well. And also here comes to balance this and to counter this and we will see later how that works. You may also want to look into InnoSys if you want to turn customers into part of your own team, helping you, contributing back. I've asked you before whether you have remote people in your companies because InnoSys helps you with flexibility and with becoming more remotely, remote friendly. Of course, it also helps to give more autonom autonomy to navigate to those working down in the trenches. So at Europace, we set out um, first chatting with a few teams, setting up a tribe that's centered around the topic of inner source. After, a couple, after some time, what became clear was that there are some common principles that would help us establish inner source in our company. One of those, com um, one of those principles was being open, transparent, and findable. Essentially, that means that you have to put all your code in a place where everyone in your company can at least read it. And not only your code, but also documentation, etc. Well, that translates to put everything on GitHub or GitHub Enterprise and you're done, right? Except that's not quite how it works. What we've seen happen is you've got Team A, which has a component or a microservice. You've got Team B, which wants to reuse this microservice. But Team B thinks it's not quite there yet. They need another feature. So what they do is to implement that feature, they send a pull request. Pull request doesn't get, a, get any attention. This kind of hurdle starts be, to, be, to bubble up towards management, which then chat to each other, create, creating more friction. Lesson learned, oh my gosh, InnoSource doesn't work. So what, didn't, what, what, what went wrong here? One thing that went wrong, maybe the pull request didn't get the attention because it's on the receiving end of the, uh, of the request. There was no priority on that particular feature. There was no communication before that whether this feature was wanted or whether it's something that fits with the architecture. So something that's still true, and that's even true in open source, start a conversation or start with a, with a ticket. I've made a little experiment, just anecdotal evidence, not st statistically relevant, but for the largest open source projects that I checked, roughly 50% of the pull requests are being rejected. What else can go wrong? The team that is making the pull request is working likely with slightly different styles, with slightly different standards to how development happens. So what they create is something that maybe doesn't fit with the code base um, that they want to contribute to. What helps with that is to think in a Mikasa, a Sukasa way. If you come to my house back at home, I will tell you what can go wrong if you visit me. Well, what is that? If you go to my kitchen and you switch on the dishwasher and the uh, water heating machine, then the fuse will blow. Similar thing you can do in your inner source project. You take a contributing document, you write down your coding guidelines, you write down testing guidelines, your, how your build pipeline works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you write all of that down? It's a pretty long list, isn't it? Nobody's ever going to read it. What you do write down is something that's most essential. How do you find what's essential? It's stuff that other people have been stumbling over before. There we are at the advice to um, value written over verbal advice. 
The goal here is to be able to collaborate as asynchronous when synchronous communi communication gets hard. Even for those in the audience that don't have any remote people, as soon as you have team members who work on slightly different schedules, as soon as, you, as meetings come into play, it starts suddenly getting more and more tricky to find time for pairing sessions. If you go one step further, if you have colleagues in your company which don't work on site, working synchronously becomes even more tricky. So what you want to do is to pull all your decision making into written form. What happened at Europace was that suddenly people tried to do everything in writing. What we learned um, through that is, sure, physical co-location is still beneficial. You should absolutely use it. If you go to any open source project, they will have on-site hackathons. They will have conferences where people meet, where you learn to put faces to people. However, all of the decision-making process should still happen in a written form, such that team members who are not in part of that meeting can participate. At Apache, um, our rule is that every decision has to happen on the mailing list, and every decision has to, like every important decision, has to be open for 72 hours. Do we have the same rule in our company? Clearly not. We are pretty much co-located, but at least in the same time zone. So depending on your um, setting, you will have to figure that out. So the gist really is that you want to take decisions where everyone can participate in a remote setting that's uh, in a written form. What happens if you do that is that you create a project memory, essentially a kind of passive documentation. What I mean with passive documentation is not a pile of documents. What I mean is something that is an archive that is searchable, that has stable URLs over time so that you can go there, drill down to your conversation, link it and send it to someone else, and that link is still valid 10 years from now. If you go to Apache, you can go to the HTTP server project and drill down to 1995 and still find the decisions and the discussions that happened there, and you can still search them. We did a retrospective at Europace on moving towards a more written communication form. Feedback that we received was pull requests are more detailed. Feedback that people received seems to rock. Just quite solid feedback. Why do you want that? Clearly, you want to remember what you did. You want to remember why you did something even years from now. So something that we have observed is something was implemented. You see it's implemented now. But you start wondering, is that a feature or can I delete it? Is that customer still around? Is that use case still around? And you only know that if you've tracked why you've implemented something. Now, if you move towards a setting where more things are being written down and archived forever, what you need to establish is a culture where mistakes are OK. What do I mean with a culture where mistakes are OK? Do you remember how back in school you were sitting in the classroom writing a test, teacher standing right at your back staring down at what you're doing? That doesn't sound very comfortable, does it? But that's exactly what it feels like in the beginning if you roll out and you want to share work in progress. GitHub has this nice feature of marking pull requests as still being in progress, something that's not supposed to be merged back. Um, that's a nice way in order to, show, to share early progress, to get early feedback from your collaborators, and to avoid running into the wrong direction. However, you need to be comfortable, and you need to have colleagues who appreciate that. What you will have to figure out as well is how much configuration you want to do to avoid things going wrong over how much convention you want to have. At Apache, we had a talk on um, com good community practices. One of them was to have little configuration and more social st uh, strings attached. So through community um, convention, people know when to merge pull requests, people know how to do things. 
If you have p teams that are not experienced with this kind of work, you likely want to, at first at least, opt for more configuration, like locked down pull requests being f locked down pull requests from being merged if they haven't received a review already, for instance. Something else for making it okay to make mistakes is to automate feedback. Something like style violations, testing violations, that's all something that a bot can tell you without overloading maintainers to do all of these reviews. With that, then you can move to a model where you value contributions over feature requests. Taken to the extreme, this means integrating your customers into your de development projects. That's something that we've done at Europace, where our platform is being developed within Europace, but used by other subsidiaries of Hippoport. And some of these sub subsidiaries decided to help us with the implementation and the refinement of the platform. So essentially taking the pull the customer in early one step further. As soon as you receive contributions, you want to reward them, typically with praise, as publicly and as early as often. One pattern that we have even in the inner source commons is um, to praise participants and to give qualified thank yous. What do you mean by the qualified thank you? I don't say thanks, thanks. I say thank you for X because it helped me do Y. This helps, this makes it more credible. It also helps the contributor um, understand which kinds of contributions are welcome and needed. However, you also can say thank you with influence. You can pull your contributors in as new trusted committers. What the heck is a trusted committer? The goal of a commi trusted committer is someone who mentors, enables, and invites new contributors. It's someone who's responsible and accountable for setting the house rules. Remember the contributions M day from earlier? They are someone who can help, who hits themselves, communicates openly and transparently. What's important about this role is that this role is filled voluntarily. So it's the way it works in our case is the invitation is sent privately to the person in question. They respond privately whether they are okay being a trusted committer, and only then it's announced publicly and widely that they are welcome as a new trusted committer. So how do you start your InnoSource initiative? There's a project out there called InnoSourceCommons.org. We've got one friend over here. I, maybe you want to stand. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if there's anyone else in the audience involved with InnoSource Commons. Not yet? OK. I know that then at least Denise is somewhere here uh, at the GitHub satellite. So what this is is essentially a group of people rolling out inner source within their organizations. What they did was to collect patterns, collaboration patterns that you can use in your organization. What they did as well was to videotape a learning path so that your organization can better understand how to roll out inner source and what it actually means. What they have as well as a couple of books on what InnoSource is, on success stories of different companies. But most importantly, it's a community that is open for you to join. There is a Slack team that you can join right now. Um, the Slack team runs under Chatham House rules. What does that mean? You can take all of the wisdom and all of the lessons learned from the InnoSource Commons and share them with everyone else, provided you are dropping um, the names of the people who shared those stories with you. Why are you supposed to drop the names? Well, if company X is sharing that something went wrong, they likely don't want to have their trademark associated with this failure story, but others still can learn from it. In addition, there's two events, one, one in spring in Europe and one in autumn in the US. So how do you get started? So where we st get, got started at Europace was with um, experiments. What do you mean by experiments? Those are real projects, but they are small. They do have a business impact, but they are small enough to not pull the entire company down. 
We took the lesson learned from these experiments, collected some in retrospectives, and shared those lessons learned with the entire company. Well, actually, we shared them with the entire world by putting them on our tech blog. So you yourself can read them as well. Um, we brought together people within the company who were into open source, who were into op inner source, and who wanted to collaborate to a monthly uh, meeting, essentially like a tribe. What, luckily, what happened was that we had one representative of each important department in that meeting, so that we could tap into the knowledge of what happens in those departments. So what we did was to collect these patterns, to share them in the organization, and to share not only what didn't work, but also the success stories and the fixes of what didn't work, so that others didn't have to repeat the mistakes that we had made. So some feedback. Yay, we've been collaborating with professionals. For those of you not speaking German, there's also a yay, it was fun. And who doesn't want to have fun at work? So to summarize, what you want to do is to strive to a open and transparent and findable collaboration. You want to value written or verbal advice. Through that with written communication, you will end up at a project memory, essentially a passive form of documentation. Again, this kind of documentation, so this is not like your entire specification of your software stack. It's nothing formal, and it's definitely not the end of the documentation story. It's your baseline. What happens at Apache, for instance, is that a lot of those uh, conversations tend to be linked down to from the formal documentation. So you don't have to rewrite it. You already have it. But if you imagine going back 20 years in history of like 300 projects discussing on a daily basis, finding that one important communication chain is going to be like searching for a needle in a haystack. So you want something more formal on top. What you need is a culture where mistakes are OK. And where you will end up with is a culture where contributions are being valued over feature requests. So there's people offering to help enabling people to help themselves. And with people helping themselves, you will end up in an um, environment where contributions are rewarded by praise and by influence. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Yes. So how do we get people to value written over verbal advice? Yeah, because it's, most of the times it's easier to go to one. Oh. So most of the times it's, it seems really easy to go to people and talk to them instead of going the way around, um, maybe open an issue or whatever. So a formal, um, yeah. So one, p one point that's important here, written over verbal doesn't imply that you have to open an issue. It could yeah. be as simple as talk to the public Slack channel so that everyone else sees it as well. So this is one way of lowering the barrier. The other thing that we observed is this, that as soon as teams are even distributed across two um, levels in the same building, there's a communication barrier between these teams. So could pretty much as well could um, be remote. So it, sometimes, it's e even then, it's easier to write on Slack. If you go beyond a certain team size, or if you go beyond a certain um, company size, it starts getting hard finding people around the corner and talking to them directly, because they may be in the meetings, they may be sick or on vacation. So at some point, it's easier to do it in a written way. The other thing is that through this um, community tribes that we created, um, we were living by example. We were living the change that we wanted to see. So people saw the advantage of it. 
Um, one, ex one ex very simple example. We've got these monthly meetings. After each meeting, I sit down and write tiny meeting minutes. Well, not so tiny, maybe. <laughs> I take these meeting minutes, I post them on Slack and on, and on GitHub. After doing this for a couple of times, this became like a role model way of running meetings, which other teams aspire to, because what they realize is you can participate in that meeting without actually being there and spending a, a t like one hour there. But you can skim read it, and you can drill down if there's something interesting to you. Okay, so your advice is to um, establish best practices in your team and then push it out to your yeah. company or whatever. Okay, yeah. thank you. And the, of course, the other thing is you need to understand why you want to do that. So you explain to people why you want to value written over verbal. In our case, what helped was to do like workshops where we looked at the reasons why we want to look into your users. And one of the pain points that the teams had was they've been developing software for years and they didn't remember why certain changes were made. And that's where they themselves understood, okay, some things have to be written down for us to remember them. Any further questions? There's one in the back, I think. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, what, what do you find is the 20% of the work that does the most effect? Uh, to put it in context, I work in enterprise and everything is heavily siloed. siloed. So all of this would be, would be great to implement, but it's almost impossible. What, what is the best way to get the advantages, at least start to get the advantages? From what I've seen um, in our company and from what I've heard about success stories in other companies, what you really want to do is to <coughs> try to find one team that buys into this. Try to run an experiment that shows that this is valuable. And from there, scale out. Don't try to convert all of your company at once, but like, try to find one trial company like one trial team, sorry. Um, for that team, try to identify what their pain points were. What we did at Opis was not roll all of that out at once and at a, uh, like from one day to the other, but it was a continuous process. So we're, we were talking to the teams, we were listening to their challenges, and for each of these, those challenges that they came up to me, I was like, hey, wait a minute, there's a solution over there. It's called you have to communicate more openly or you have to value written advice more. Or just recently we had the issue of, wait a minute, I want to um, drill down into GitHub notifications after the fact, like, I have joined today, but I want to see the notification from yesterday. Well, there's an easy fix. Direct all of those to a channel where everyone can access them, fine, done. So try to take one team, try to fix their challenges, and then talk about how good that is to the rest of the company. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Last chance, three, two, one. <laughs> With that, I would like to say thank you. Um, first of all, to all of you listening, Second of all, to Innosus Commons for providing hints and being helpful. Also to, in my personal case, to the Apache Software Foundation, which is the basis of a lot of these lessons learned, but also like to the guys representing the company. Can you just stand up and turn around? <laughs> you knew that was, this was coming. <laughs> Thank you for following along. Thank you for being the genie pick for this. <laughs> Thank you, guys.